Good morning, United. It's, it's great to be here with you today. Um, bring greetings to your pastor, Charlene Hill, who I've known for a very long time. She was a year ahead of me in seminary, so she graduated a year before I did. So, But we had a lot of fun going through seminary and sharing as we both matriculated and we are ordained. I also bring greetings from the Illinois Conference and Molly Carlson, who was the conference minister of the 220 churches of the United Church of Christ, in Illinois, of the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ. I am responsible for the 88 churches within the Chicago Metropolitan Association, primarily for pastoral care. As Weijin said, I, I do work with programs, innovation, and events. And so if there's something special happening, it usually comes through my portfolio. Uh, praise God for standing in the sacred space, and thank you, Weijin, for, for our friendship and for our fellowship and for what we share as ministers of the gospel. Uh, thank you all for inviting me here. Glad to be here. And really look forward to the meeting afterwards um, to provide maybe some clarity and some sense of direction. We are here to help the church from the conference and from the association. So whatever you need, um, if there's something that's too, that you have a question with, feel free, give me a call. And praise God for Jade. Uh, I know Jade for a while. Um, when I was a pastor at Park Manor, uh, she helped me with some music things and some initiatives that we were trying to get off the ground. So blessings. I won't tarry too long. I'm going to try to get in and get out and say what God's given me to say and sit down. I have a word from the Lord, and it begs a question. And that question is, what do we really believe about church today? What do we really believe about church today? Let me pray. Loving and precious God, we thank you for standing in this sacred space. Thank you, God, for this church which desires to do thy will. And so, God, hide me behind the cross of Calvary that it be none of me and all of thee. Oh, God, if it's not on the pad, put it in my heart to say, I thank you for this momentous opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk. And for that, I give your name praise, honor, and glory. It is in the holy name of Jesus that we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. What do we really believe about church today? I like to open with a story, and the story goes, Once upon a time in a small village nestled at the foot of a great mountain lived a humble farmer named Samuel. Every day Samuel tended to his fields, planting and harvesting crops to feed his family and the villagers. Despite his hard work, he often struggled with doubt and uncertainty about his future. One year, a terrible drought struck the land. The once fertile soil became dry and cracked, and Samuel's crops began to wither. As the days grew hotter and the rain refused to fall, fear and despair spread among the villagers. Many began to lose hope, believing that the drought would ruin them. One evening as Samuel sat on his porch, he noticed a little girl named Mary walking by with a small pot. Curiously, he called out to her, Mary, where are you going with that pot? She says, I'm going to church, she replied with a smile. But why, Samuel asked, puzzled. Mary held the pot up and said, I'm bringing this pot to collect water. Pastor James told us that if we pray and believe, God will send rain. So I'm bringing this pot to be ready when the rain comes. Samuel was taken aback by Mary's simple yet profound faith. Despite the dry sky and the parched earth, she believed so strongly that she prepared for the blessing she had yet to see. Inspired by Mary's unwavering belief, Samuel decided to join her. He dusted off an old barrel from his shed and rolled it to the church. Soon other villagers moved by the side of Samuel and Mary began to do the same. They bought pots and buckets, barrels, placing them outside the walls of the church in hopeful anticipation of rain. That night the villagers gathered together and prayed earnestly for rain. 
They prayed with the belief that God would hear them and would provide. As they prayed, the sound of thunder rumbled in the distance. They rushed outside to their amazement. Dark clouds that gathered overhead. Rain began pouring down, filling their pots and barrels to the brim. The dry land drank deeply and crops were revived. The villagers rejoiced, not just for the rain, but for the renewed faith that had united and strengthened them. Samuel looked at Mary and said, your belief brought us together and brought us the blessing that we need. From now on, I will always carry this faith in my heart. Beloved, many of our lives are like Samuel and the villagers. We face droughts of doubt and despair, like the church and the village in the story, many of the churches that I visit in the Chicago Metropolitan Association are filled with doubt and despair. 80% of them are challenged with dwindling cash flow, an aging membership, lack of community engagement, and lack of a vision, and sometimes lack of faith. But I share with them that if they will take the time and the energy to assess their gifts, assess the needs of the neighboring community, strategically align their strengths and resources to meet the needs of the community, this could lead to a renewed vision for the church. Beloved, we saw in our opening story that belief was not just hoping for the best, but preparing for it, even when evidence suggests otherwise. It is this kind of faith that brings us together, uplifts our spirits, and invites God's blessings into our lives. Let us carry this belief in our hearts, ready to receive the rain of grace that will nourish and sustain us. Today, I want to talk a little bit about how we, as a body of believers, can fully live into our beliefs about church. Many of us find that we are challenged to discover what are the truths that we believe about church. Many of us find that we are challenged to discover what the truths are that we believe about church. I think the whole landscape of church changed as we emerged from the pandemic. Many of our foundational beliefs as a church are challenged by a culture that roots its beliefs in idealistic pseudo-reality. Therefore, we need to work to understand some facts which support truths provided by an expert. See, you see, Nicodemus is fascinating because he represents who we have been in our spiritual journeys. There are some spiritual facts that Nicodemus needed to understand which supported some truths provided by an expert. I'll unpack that. Nicodemus was a scholar of the Pharisees. He was bred to learn. He was a ruler of the Jews, a senator, and a lawyer who had a seat on a powerful Sanhedrin. Remember the Sanhedrin were the supreme court of their day. Jesus described Nicodemus as teacher of Israel. He was renowned for his interpretation of Hebrew scripture. However, even with all this authority and knowledge, he still had some questions. He knew that his questions were intimate and private. Therefore, he requested an evening interview, a campfire chat, a private session, an independent study, a one-on-one -on -one with the rabbi, the teacher, Jesus. So we see Nicodemus coming at night to seek some clarification and instruction of what he should really believe. Beloved, in our spiritual journeys, things happen to us that we don't understand. Life happens and sometimes has no explanation. We live life and face situations that we don't even know how to interpret. Sometimes, beloved, we need to have a chat with Jesus. Sometimes we need a one-on-one -on -one at the nighttime, at the night hour, just like Nicodemus. Nicodemus is our example that sometimes the challenges of life will make us question our belief. So instead of phoning a friend to seek wise counsel, instead of trying to find a self-help book, and us, or instead of self-soothing, Nicodemus encourages us to have a chat with Jesus. I like this text for many reasons. The conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus is intriguing on many fronts. 
it takes Jesus 11 verses to explain being born again is a requisite to enter the kingdom of God. In these 11 verses, Jesus teaches Nicodemus that his new birth is a spiritual birth and not a physical birth through water. I think that Nicodemus' real question is, spiritual rebirth any more possible than physical rebirth? In verse 3, Jesus' words declare that the most unique requirement for entrance into the kingdom of heaven is one must be born again. In Greek, this means from above and again or anew. In other words, whoever wants to be part of the kingdom of God must be born anew from above. I believe that God is calling the post-pandemic church to be born anew. Today, the church is being called to evaluate itself. Not just here, but many of the churches look at its strengths and understand the needs of the community. However, those initiatives can't be accomplished until the church becomes clear about what it believes. While today's text speaks at great length about spiritual rebirth, the core of this teaching is belief. What is it that we believe? What is it that we really believe? As the United Church of Christ, our foundational beliefs are captured in the statement of faith. Found in many New Century hymnals, if you have New Century hymnals, on pages 885, the first sentence says, We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our God, and to your deeds we testify. Remaining of the statement of faith talks about God in creation, God in salvation, God in judgment, God as giver of the Holy Spirit, God and the church, and God's promises. Beloved, we believe in the sovereignty of a great God. However, the church's foundational beliefs are being challenged by the largest single group in the United States called the nuns. Pew Research says that nuns are people who describe themselves as either atheist, agnostic, or with no religious affiliation. Pew Research categorizes nuns as religiously unaffiliated, which are, and they are under the age of 55. They either claim no religion or they don't identify with any religion. The nuns say that they have skepticism about religious teachings. They lack a belief in God. Nuns claim that they don't have a need for religion in their life. They don't have time for religion. And they have had bad experiences with religious people. This, my beloved, is a clarion call for the church to renew itself. I feel that the pandemic has changed the attitudes and the practices of the church. Former staunch churchgoers pre-pandemic have found other things to do on Sundays. Some churches, few churches, one or two churches are not very welcoming of new visitors because of the various cliques and unintentional exclusion. Parents with active children find that sports, athletic directors, and coaches have games scheduled on Sunday during church hour. Generally, what has happened is people have become apathetic to God, to religion, to church, and there is a spiritual drought across our land. The church needs to believe in the power of prayer, just like that little church that I talked about in my opening story. The paradigm has shifted for the church. There is a call for the church to be reclaimed and reclaim its relevance in the everyday lives of people. Post-pandemic beliefs about church are diverse and reflect changes in attitudes. And practices that have emerged are being reinforced during COVID-19 pandemic. Here are some key beliefs about today's church. The first one, 
it's important to be flexible. Many people believe that churches need to remain flexible and adaptive. The shift to online services during the pandemic was seen as a positive change. However, when we came back from the pandemic, people wanted to stop their online presence because it's an awful lot of work and many churches don't have budgets for them. Hybrid worship is here to stay. There's a strong belief that hybrid models of worship which combine online and in-person services are essential for the future. Beloved, this approach caters to the diverse needs and allows greater accessibility for those who cannot attend in person due to health, mobility, and or geographic constraints. Community focus. The pandemic underscored the importance of community and social support. People now expect churches to play a more active role in fostering community connections and providing support networks, especially during times of crisis. Enhanced role of technology. The effective use of technology during the pandemic has led to the belief that churches should engage and continue to engage in the digital tools for communication, for effective outreach and community engagement. This includes live streaming like today, maintaining an active social media presence, and offering virtual events. The fifth one is mental health and well-being. Beloved, there is a growing belief that churches should address mental health and well-being more directly. The pandemic's impact on mental health has prompted many congregants to look to their churches for support services counseling, holistic, and wellness programs. Social justice and activism. Many people now expect church to be more vocal and active in social justice issues. The pandemic highlighted various social inequities and there is a belief that the church has a moral responsibility to advocate for justice, support marginalized communities, and engage in activism. There is a decline in traditional attendance. Beloved, as we all know and have experienced, there is an acknowledgement that traditional church attendance may decline and has been declining even before the pandemic. Some people have been accustomed to worshiping from home and may not return. Many of the churches that I visit have, say, one-third of the people have not returned. Now, I'm surmising that one-third of the one, or one-half of that one-third has just found other things to do. The other half, or the one-sixth of the one-third, one are actually glued to their computers, glued to their phones, glued to public media, to tune in to not only one church service, but two churches. Rethinking our sacred space. The concept of what constitutes a sacred space has broadened. People now believe that worship and spiritual experiences are not confined to a physical church building. Homes, outdoor spaces, virtual environments are all seen as valid spaces for a spiritual connection. Greater inclusivity. There's a belief that churches should strive to be more inclusive. This includes being welcoming to diverse populations, including those who might feel marginalized by traditional church structures and practices. Financial sustainability. This is a big one. This is one that the majority of the churches in the Illinois Conference and across the UCC and other church denominations are wrestling with. The pandemic's economic impact has led to concerns about the financial sustainability of many churches. People believe that churches need to find innovative ways to secure funding and manage resources to continue their mission and services effectively. 
These beliefs reflect a shift towards a more adaptive, inclusive, and community-oriented vision of the church, one that integrates modern technology and addresses contemporary social issues while maintaining core spiritual functions. Remember, beloved, we really believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has forever prov pro provided his love to those who follow him. God gave his son as an everlasting expression of God's affection for humanity. Beloved, it is proof that God loves us today and wants us to live with God forever. All that God has asked for is for us to believe. Amen.